D99 by HB5, Chapter 7. This LibriVox recording is in public domain. Westervelt was still sitting with Joe Rosencrantz in the communications room when Colburn's call came through. He looked over Joe's shoulder as the operator swiveled to face his telephone viewer. How come you remember the number, he greeted Colburn. Did the elevator doors close on you? Very funny, ha-ha, retorted Colburn. Look, Joe, have you got power? Westervelt peered closer, thinking that the redhead looked unusually concerned. Rosencrantz seemed not to have noticed. Power, he said. Have I got power? I can pull in stations you never heard of. Just on willpower. You, you poor slob. You don't even remember if you're on your way home or coming to work. What is it now? I'll tell you what it is, shouted Colburn. It's a power failure. They don't even have any lights out on the street. I nearly got trampled to death getting back in the lobby to phone you. Westervelt and Rosencrantz looked at each other. Come to think of it, Charlie, said the operator. The lights did blink a minute ago. I wonder if that was our own power taking over for the whole floor. They saw Colburn turn his head and heard him expostulating with someone who plainly was impatient to get into the phone cubicle. I'll go check the meters, said Rosencrantz. Watch the space set for me, Willie. What, what, what? Stuttered Westervelt, groping after him. Charlie, he went away. What do I do if a call comes in? Colburn finished dealing with his own problem downstairs and returned his attention to Westervelt. He requested a repeat. I said that Joe went around the corner to check the power, babbled the youth. What do I do if a space call comes in? He said to watch the set. Oh, said Colburn. You see the little red star-shaped light at the left of the board under the screen? Yeah, yeah. It's out, Charlie. Well, it should be. It's an automatic call indicator set for our code. If it goes on, it shows you're getting a call even if you have the screen too dark or the audio too low to notice. So you look for a green one like it on the other side. Yeah, I see it. You push the button beside it, and our code goes out automatically to acknowledge. Then you push the next button underneath, which puts out a repeating signal to stand by. Got that so far? I got it, said Westervelt. Then what? Then you go scream for Joe at the top of your lungs. That covers everything. You are now a deep space operator. Just don't touch any of those buttons until you get a license. But Charlie... He was saved by the return of Rosencrantz, for whom he thankfully vacated space before the phone. Colburn was again engaged in making faces at some other desperate commuter. You were right, Charlie, said Rosencrantz. We're strictly on our own private power. The whole floor, as near as I can tell. I thought they were being fussy when they put it in, but maybe it will pay off at that. How does it look down there? It's a mess, said Colburn. You wouldn't believe there were so many people working in our building. No, no, said Rosencrantz. I mean, what's the situation? Is it just this building that's cut off, or the whole city, or what? You can't believe anything they're saying, Colburn told them, but they had somebody yapping on the public address system. It seems as the whole section of the city, about 50 blocks square, cut off. They're talking about a main cable overloading. I can imagine what they're saying, said Rosencrantz. The poor guy's stuck with finding and replacing it, I mean. Colburn gave a hollow laugh. You think they're the only ones stuck? There ain't a single subway belt moving to the suburban heliports. All the local surface monorails are stopped. You should see the way they're packing the ground taxis, and the cops won't let any more helicabs come down. They're supposed only to pick up from the roof, said Rosencrantz. That isn't where the people are. The people are all down here with me, and half of them are trying to get in the booth to tell their wives they won't be home. Well, there's a lot of us won't get home tonight, if the boys don't find that break pretty soon. Westervelt and Rosencrantz exchanged glances. The youth shrugged. He'd been planning on staying late anyhow. Tell him to come back up, Joe, he suggested. We have food in the locker for visitors and he can clear a table in here to snooze on. Colburn had heard him, and was shaking his head. I'd like nothing better, Willie, he said, but I might as well start walking. It's better on the level than on the stairs. What do you mean, stairs? I don't know about the other buildings around here, but they regretfully announced that there will be no elevators running above the 70-50 floor in this one. In fact, they only have partial service that high, on the building's emergency power generator. Rosencrantz looked worried. Broodingly, he fumbled out a box of cigarettes. What do you think, Charlie? he asked. I mean, Leibman? That's why I called, said Colburn. I think you better check the stairs and tell Smith. If he starts our boy down them, the 99 floors will give him something to keep his mind busy. The pressure from outside finally intimidated him into switching off. The last I saw of him on the fading phone screen, he was striving desperately to ease himself out of the booth in the face of a bellowing rush of harried commuters for the phone. Joe sighed, trying to light his smoke from the wrong end of the box. I'm going to check our elevator, Joe, Westervelt said. He left the communications room and trotted up the corridor and around the corner. Through the main doors, he caught sight of Pauline peering out her compartment. A thought struck him. He hurried over to her and thrust his head to the opening in her glass partition. Were you still on that line, cutie, he demanded. What line, demanded Pauline indignantly. Oh, Willie, does this mean we have to walk down 25 floors tonight? You little. Listen, 
Don't let out a peep about this until we know more. Why not, Willie? Do you want to get everybody upset? How can they dream up brilliant ideas while they're worrying about ordering sandwiches sent up? Promise. Pauline reluctantly gave her word not to say anything without consulting him. Westervelt returned to the hall where he pressed the button for the elevator. He waited about three times as long as it usually took to get a car, then tried again with the same lack of results. Looking up, he discovered that even the red light over the entrance to the stairs was out. That, apparently, had not been part of the 99th floor system now powered by their own generator. Westervelt took the few steps to the doorway concealing the stairs. There was beautifully reproduced notice on the door, informing all persons that this was an emergency exit and that the door would open automatically in case of fire or other emergency. It further offered detailed directions on how to leave, which in simple language meant, go downstairs. The door is shut, muttered Westervelt, so that proves there isn't any emergency. He tried the handle. It did not budge, except for a slight clicking. Feeling slightly uneasy, he leaned over to squint at the crack of the door. He spotted the latch, a sturdy bar, and saw that he was moving it. There was, however, another bar which did not move, and the door refused to slide open. Of course, he breathed. It's made to open automatically. How would they do that? By electricity? What haven't we got plenty of? The damn thing's locked. Somebody designed a beautiful setup. He looked about the empty corridor, jittering indecisively. I could call downstairs before I tell Smitty, he reminded himself. For the sake of having a handy shoulder to cry on, he went all the way back to the communications room to use a phone. He made a gesture of throwing up his hands as Job looked around, then got Pauline on the phone. See if you can get me the building manager's office, he requested. Don't be surprised if it's busy for a couple of minutes. It was nearer 15 minutes before his call went through. During that time, he learned that Rosencrantz took a serious view of the inconvenience. I guess you heard some of the talk about Bob Leidman, said the operator. Well, some is imagination, but a lot of it's true. He spent a long time in a hellhole out among the stars. And if there's anything that might shove him off course, it's the idea that he can't get out. No matter where he is, he has to know he can leave when he feels like it. But if he doesn't know about it, asked Westervelt, how long can you keep it quiet? I bet you can see a blackout from the window. Watch the set. I'll take a look. Oh, now wait a minute, Joe. Westervelt's consternation was diverted by the call that came through at that moment. A perspiring face with ruffled gray hair, which Westervelt could remember having seen occasionally about the lobby downstairs, looking extremely sleek and well-groomed, appeared on the phone screen. If you're above the 75th, walk down that far. If you're lower... Walk down as far as you can, said the man hoarsely. If you can stay put, that's the best thing. Tell me what power failure, not responsibility of the building management, said the sweating gentleman. Please cooperate. But what? We're doing all we can, and this phone is busy, young man. Will you please? The stairs are locked, shouted Westervelt. For a moment, he doubted that he had penetrated the official's panic. Then he saw a new outrage in the man's eyes. What did you say? Westervelt explained about the door to the stairs. The gentleman downstairs clapped both hands to his moist cheeks. He had begun to look numb. After a long pause, he pulled himself together enough to promise that he would look into the matter. As he switched off, Westervelt heard him muttering that it was just too much. You hear that, Joe? He asked. Yeah, and I didn't like it, replied the operator. What does that leave us? No elevators, no stairs. How about the helicopter roof? You have to walk up a flight of stairs to get there, said Westervelt, thinking of the department's three helicopters garage and their private tower roof. It's the same door. I suppose the door to the top is frozen, too. Well, anyway, that could be worse, said Joe. That makes two doors to knock open, and I bet your boys have some little gadget around that will do that. Westervelt felt better. There was always a way out, he told himself. Just the same, he thought he had better let Smith know about the situation. He told Joe where he was going and headed back up the hall. When he reached the corner, he tried the door again for luck. The luck was the same. He wondered whether to go look in the lab for some burning tool. On second thought... He decided that if any damage had to be done to the building, it was not his responsibility. He turned to enter the main office, flashing Pauline a wink that he hoped would look reassuring. Simonetta was busy with a case folder, but Beryl was seizing an opportunity to repair her nail polish of iridescent gold. She eyed him curiously as he bent over to whisper into the brunette's ear. Are they still working in there, Si? he asked. She drew away with a mock frown, demanding, What's so confidential? Are you spying for Yolene? Westervelt scowled over her head out the window. It was twilight outside, and he noted that there were only a few dim lights in nearby tall buildings. I just wanted to see Mr. Smith, he forced himself to say. Don't tell me you want to go home now that you've got all the rest of us to say we'd stay. She softened when she saw that he had no wisecrack and readiness.
You know I didn't mean that, Willie, she said. Is something the matter? Of all the people in the department, Simonetta was the one he found it easiest to confide in. He had to struggle with himself, especially since he saw no reason why she should not know. I, uh, just wanted to see him a minute, he said lamely. I'll come back later. He got out of the office, feeling his neck burn under the combined stares of the two girls. In the corridor, he halted to survey the sealed off means of egress. Both the elevator and the stairway door looked normal enough except for the red exit light being dark. Westervelt wondered if it would be smart to go around and adjust all the window filters so that no one would expect to see many city lights should they happen to glance outside. He went over to the door for one last examination, wishing that it were a hinge type instead of a sliding. While he was bending to peep at the lock, he heard a sound behind him and leaped up guiltily. Smith stood six feet away, outside the hall door of his office. He had planted one fist on his hip and was running the other hand through his rumpled hair as he gaped at Westervelt. There's no keyhole there, Willie, he said at last. Westervelt had the feeling that he ought to offer the perfectly simple explanation with which he had been living for what seemed like hours. The words refused to come. Does this have anything to do with the message Cy just brought me? demanded Smith. What message? asked Westervelt, clearing his throat. The police called and claimed someone reported seeing, from the air, three helicopters being stolen from our roof. Did she say that? asked Westervelt. She had the sense to write it down and show me while they were talking about submarines. Something about the way she winked made me think I'd better come out, so I told the boys I was going down the hall a minute. Westervelt heaved a sigh. He would not have to be alert to duck an aroused lightman charging down the corridor. Then, Mr. Smith, he suggested, let's walk down that way in case someone comes out and sees us, and I'll tell you all about it. They shouldn't be out for a while, Smith commented, examining the youth doubtfully. I started a little argument before I came out. Nevertheless, he followed Westervelt around the far corner, to the wing leading to the laboratory and restrooms. They had gone perhaps ten feet past the corner when Westervelt finished the report on the elevators and came to the frozen locks on the stairway door. Smith stopped in his tracks, as if to run back and check for himself, but restrained himself. "'You're absolutely sure, Willie?' he asked. "'You can check with Joe Rosencrantz, Mr. Smith, or you can call the office of the building manager downstairs.' Smith rubbed his high-bridged nose as he pondered. His lips moved, and Westervelt thought he read the name Lydman. Then Smith checked off on his fingers, muttering, The stairs, elevators, and helicopters. No wonder they were stolen, he said. Someone saw a chance to make some easy money with all the heli-taxis taken. The police will find them tomorrow. Meanwhile, I guess it's some trouble to us, said Westervelt. Yes, it might be some trouble, admitted Smith. And this time said it aloud. Lydman. We won't mention it to him yet, right, Willie? End of chapter 7《of D99 by H.B. Fife. This LibriVox recording is in public domain. The room would have been nearly a cube except for the fact that hardly any parallel lines appeared in its design. The corners were rounded and the ceiling slightly arched. The floor, though much of it was obscured by a plentiful supply of cushions, was obviously several inches higher in the center than where it curved up to meet the walls. All surfaces were the color of old ivory but seemed to be of a more porous material. The cushions could have been cut from slabs of some foamy, resilient substance that had been manufactured in several other dull colors. On two of the larger cushions placed end to end lay a blonde man, long and lean. He wore a dark gray coverall that was loose as if he had lost weight. His features had a poor color, a golden tan with something unhealthy underlying it. He was, however, clean and recently shaven, and his hair was cut short, if somewhat raggedly. He stirred then blinked into the soft light of an elliptical fixture recessed into the ceiling. With a smothered groan, he came completely awake, very carefully, as if from long habit of avoiding painful movement. He rolled to his left side and braced one hand against the floor. The effort of sitting up made him bare his clenched teeth. The grimace was fleeting. He seemed to have some purpose that drove him on to roll completely off the makeshift bed until he knelt with both knees and his left hand on smooth floor. As he paused to rest, he held his right hand close to his body. After a moment, he brought his right foot up opposite his left knee. Another rest period, on hand, knee, and foot. It was required before he shoved himself away from the floor and slowly stood upright. The ceiling suddenly looked too low. He was tall, perhaps two inches over six feet. His features were regular, without being especially handsome. A man sizing him up might have expected him to weigh about 190 pounds. 
but slight hollows in his cheeks suggested this would not be true at the moment. His eyes were blue, but the lids drooped, and he seemed to focus only vaguely upon his surroundings. At length, the man turned and walked deliberately to the side of the room where a doorless opening offered egress into what looked like a corridor. The opening was in the shape of an ellipse about five feet high and three feet wide, beginning a few inches above the floor. He bent to thrust his head into the wall, peering in both directions, but taking no heed of faint, scurrying sounds out there. Satisfied, he walked back to his bed, turned over a cushion with his toe, and kicked a small utility bag of gray plastic out into the open. The man stared at the bag for some minutes before reaching an evidently unwelcome decision. Laboriously, then, he knelt until he could slide one end under a knee and slide open the zipper with his left hand. He pawed out a few items. Battery shaver, towel, deck of cards, toothbrush which he left scattered on the floor as soon as he located the object of his search. This was a many-jointed mechanism of metal that resembled an armored centipede. It was as long as his hand and nearly as broad. He held it in his palm, as if wondering what to do with it. Some slow process of judgment having blossomed in his mind, he turned over the subject to press a small stud. The plates of the belly parted. From a recess there, he fumbled out a miniature accessory that fitted easily in the palm of his hand. This was round, about an inch thick, and might have been made of black plastic. The man's lips twitched in a tired smile as he hefted it pensively. Without moving from his kneeling position, he thumbed a nearly concealed switch on the edge of the disc. Within seconds, the thing began to put forth music, a diminutive reproduction of the sound of a full orchestra. The man gradually raised his hand until he held the little player to his ear. His expression remained uncomprehending. He lowered his hand, shrugging slightly and turned off the music. Once more he forced himself laboriously to his feet, leaving his other belongings on the floor without a backward glance. He strode to the door with the pace of a man who has just walked five or ten miles. His long legs carried him across the distance in only a few steps, but there was a slowness, a heaviness, in their motion that revealed a deep weariness. He raised one foot just high enough to step through the opening into the corridor. Outside, he turned left and walked along at the same pace passing several other doors at irregular intervals. That they may have led to other rooms with other occupants seemed to interest him not at all. He neither glanced aside nor paused until he came face to face with a barrier, a wall blocking his path. It was the first doorway that sported a door, and the latter was closed. It looked to be made of a plastic substance, darker than the ivory walls among which he had thus far moved, but smoother. There was a grilled opening, more or less centered, but no other markings. Nevertheless, the blond man seemed to know where the portal would be fastened. He ran the tips of his fingers along one curved side, as if judging a distance. Juggling the black disc in his hand until the grip suited him better, he pressed a second switch, which was concealed at the center of the object. A thin jet of flame, so white that it far outshone the lighting of the corridor, flared against the edge of the door. He moved the flame along the edge for about two feet. Then he snapped it out, and waited with his eyes blinking painfully. The corridor lighting had been revealed to be yellow and dim. Having rested, the man took a deep breath and shoved with his left shoulder against the elliptical door. It slipped off whatever had been holding it at the opposite edge and fell into the hallway beyond the bulkhead. He had neatly cut through two hinges on the other side. Without looking back, he stepped over the loose door and continued on his way. Eventually he came to another such barrier, and he dealt with it in the same fashion. The third time he was halted, he found himself at a vertical column, which passed down through an oval opening in the ceiling and disappeared through another in the floor of the corridor. The man hesitated. A vague sadness flitted across his features. Then, as if driven by some deep purpose, he approached the column, in the most regular shape he had encountered anywhere. The surface of it was ringed by horizontal grooves nearly an inch deep and looked as if it would be easy to climb. From the hole below, there rose slightly warmer air, bearing a blend of pungent and musty odors. The man's nostrils wrinkled. He stepped to the edge of the opening, then sidled around until he had the greatest possible space on his side of the column. The instrument in his hand finally came to his attention as he reached out to touch the grooved surface. He considered it for a long moment. Apparently he was pleased at the brilliance of the thought that eventually moved him to thrust the thing into a pocket of his pants. He faced the column again, and again hesitated. His right hand lifted an inch, indecisively, following which a snarl of pain twisted his lips. Sidling around the opening once more until he found himself having completed a circuit, he 
he let the fingers of his left hand explore the grooves. It did not seem to occur to him to look either down or up, although faint distant sounds were borne to him on the current of odoriferous air. In the end, he leaned forward until his left shoulder came against the slim column. He wrapped his left arm about it, a little scrambling, and he had gripped it between his legs. Then a slight relaxation of his hold permitted him to slide gradually downward until he slipped past the floor line. There were only a few inches to spare between his shoulders and the edge of the opening, as if the latter had not been designed for such as he. The next level into which he descended was dark. He continued to slide cautiously downward. At the second level below his starting point, there was light. The corridor resembled that in which he had begun his journey. He put out one foot to catch the edge of the opening while he rested. This hallway curved not far from the man in one direction, although the other side ran straight for about 20 feet before being closed off by a door similar to the one he had removed. Around the bend floated faint noises, suggesting high-pitched conversation, although they came from too far away to reveal the nature of their origin. The tall man kept one eye cocked warily in that direction. After a few minutes, certain sounds seemed to draw nearer. The chittering talk faded, but he could hear more plainly a hushed scuffling that could have been caused by many feet taking short, hurried steps. The man released his foothold and slid smoothly below the floor level just as moving shadows appeared at the bend of the corridor. He dropped down the column through four more unlighted levels, reaching an atmosphere that held a blend of machine oil along with its other odors. Light filtered upward with the air currents. Somewhere below was a very bright level whence came the rhythmic throb of heavy machinery. This did not resemble the sounds of a spaceship, nor yet a Terran factory, but some considerable work was being carried on. He was on a level so dim that he touched the edge of the floor opening with his toe to make sure of its location before moving off along the corridor. In the darkness, he went more slowly than before, but made better time than looked possible. Under the circumstances, he reassured himself by stretching out his left hand every few seconds to touch the smooth wall. He walked normally, though not noisily, and his sense of direction was extraordinarily good. About a hundred yards along a corridor that seemed not to have a single bend or corner, he slowed his pace doubtfully. A few steps more brought him to another closed door. This one, however, yielded to his shove, swinging back to reveal a stretch of tunnel with a bare minimum of illumination oozing from widely spaced ceiling fixtures. Here he could sense side doorways his fingers had usually missed along the darker stretch. He had gone another hundred yards and finally passed two cross corridors before he was again obliged to stop and rest. He slumped against the side wall, favoring his right arm and gazing dully before him. A few steps further along was one of the typical elliptical doorways. Through this one, some light was reflected to the wall of the corridor. The man stared at it in the way anyone in the dark will turn his eye to light. After several minutes, he moved toward it as if impelled by idle curiosity. Reaching the opening, he hesitated. A strange expression flickered over his face. The decision to look or not to look was causing him great uneasiness. Finally, he stepped forward and entered a small chamber. This was evidently located so as to house another slim column that disappeared upward and downward into unknown levels. Several small oval windows were set just below the ceiling, at a height which presented no particular difficulty to the man when he stepped over to look through them. The scene that met his eye was a wide corridor, so wide that it might be termed a concourse or even a public square. Members of the public that were to be observed frequenting it were very, very far from being human. Two of them scurried past his window, clearly illuminated by lights far up in the dome ceiling. They were furry, about five feet tall, lithe and cat-like in their movements. Compared to a human, they were slim and short-bodied. They possessed three arms and three legs, each set being equally spaced about their bodies. Now and then, as they walked with short, rapid steps, Frequent joints were apparent in all limbs, showing clearly that they were not just muscular tentacles. From the openings at the apexes of their heads, which must have been mouths, they were streamlined in a fashion that made it more natural to picture them swimming like Terran cuttlefish than climbing up and down thick poles. The three eyes set about each head were low enough to allow for jaw muscles. The man watched this pair slide down a column set beside the wall that concealed him. Other individuals were scattered about the wide concourse. Almost without exception, they wore nothing more than a pouch, secured by a belt just above what would have been the hips and a human. Clothing was made unnecessary by handsome coats of short, honey-colored fur that enhanced their feline air. Sometimes, when one or another bent or twisted, purple skin would show through the fur. Across the concourse, the man could see the open stalls that suggested shops. 
Most of them were dark inside, with nettings stretched across the fronts. The general atmosphere was not unlike that of a small Terran business section, or even a spaceport terminal, late in the evening with business slack and only night workers about. Abruptly, those abroad scuttled for the walls. A perfectly good reason for the exodus appeared a moment later, as a column of low, long vehicles dashed from a high-arched tunnel and shot across the open space. Each was three-wheeled and carried half a dozen individuals wearing what resembled thick plastic armor. Cages of metal guarded their heads, and they bore weapons like Terran rocket launchers. The convoy passed out of sight before the man could note more. He retreated thoughtfully from the window. At the opening to the corridor, he paused indecisively. He shook his head, as if trying to put out of his mind what he had just witnessed. It might have been prudent for anyone in his position to give the corridor a searching look before entering, but this did not seem to occur to him. In seconds, he was striding along in the former direction, if anything, a trifle more briskly. As he walked, the muffled sounds from the scene he had examined faded in the distance. Once again, he was alone, with his own discreet footfalls. Several times, he passed junctions of cross corridors, and once, he had to burn open a door. But never did he meet an inhabitant of the hive-like city. Either the way had been shrewdly chosen, or it was seldom used at this period of the day. Even granting both, his luck must have been fantastic. The corridor had begun to assume an almost hypnotic monotony when it ended bluntly at a column leading only upward. The man perforce was faced with the challenge of climbing it, a prospect which he obviously did not relish. Sighing, he reversed his earlier procedure in sliding down other poles. With only one good arm, pulling himself up was slow work. It was, perhaps, only the fact that the levels were constructed to suit beings five feet tall that made it possible for him to make it to the next level up. He sat with his legs dangling through the opening, panting, while perspiration oozed out to beat his forehead. This time, he was nearly half an hour in recovering and working up the determination required to go on. The corridor in which he found himself ran at right angles to the one below. It was wider and higher, as if more traveled, but any such open area as he had peeped at was far to the rear. Nearby, however, was a much larger door than he had yet encountered. He walked over to it. When a tentative push produced no results, he dipped his left hand into a pocket for the black disc. He seemed to have a good idea where to locate the hinges on this door, too. When he had burned through, the door was harder to shove aside because it turned out to be of double thickness. The hinges had been concealed from both inside and outside. The tall man now found himself only a few steps from another such portal in what looked like an anteroom. Methodically, he proceeded to burn his way through, squinting in the bright light of the flame, but otherwise betraying no emotion. The last door fell away, fresh air billowed in around him, and he could see stars in a night sky outside. Without haste, he stepped outside. The tan plastery wall reared above him for about ten levels. Off to his left, shadows on the ground showed a jagged shape, so it was probable that another part of the building towered upward after a setback. The ground around the exit was perfectly level and bare of any vegetation. The nearest life was a wall of shrub-like trees about a hundred feet away, and toward these the man began to walk in the same tired pace. He found, as if by instinct, a broad, well-kept path through the trees. A mild breeze caused the long, hanging leaves to rustle. Without looking back, the man followed the path up a gentle slope and over the curve of the hill. At the bottom of the downgrade, two figures shrank suddenly back into the shadows. He kept walking. That you, Gerson, came a loud whisper as the two Terrans stepped forward again. Come on, we have an air car over here. Did anyone follow you? The tall man turned to go with them through a fringe of trees. It seemed like a poor time to try to talk, with the possibility of pursuit behind them. The two bundled him into the black shape of the air car in silence and moved it cautiously through the trees just above the ground. They raised into the clear air only when they had put half a mile between them and the towering hive city. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of D99 by H.B. Fife. This LibriVox recording is in public domain. In the library, between Smith's corner office and the conference room that adjoined the communications center, Westervelt sat and watched Leidman pore over a technical report in the blue binding of the Department of Interstellar Relations. Half a dozen other volumes, old and new, technical and diplomatic, were scattered about the table between them. The youth caught himself running a hand through his hair in Smith's usual manner, and stopped, appalled. He judged, after due reflection, that it might be worse, 
He could have picked up some of Leidman's peculiarities instead. Probably, he told himself, he ought to show some better sense and imitate the suavity of Parrish if he had to adopt the manners of anyone in the department. Unfortunately, he did not like Parrish very well, even when he was not engaged in being actively jealous of the man. Someday, Willie, he mused, you'll snap too. When you do, it would be just your style to take after this massive beef in front of you. Immediately, he was ashamed of the thought. Leidman had been, in his way, nicer to him than anyone else. Moreover, he was far from being a massive beef. Westervelt recalled the sight of Leidman on an open beach, where he seemed more at ease than anywhere else. The man kept himself hard-muscled and trim. Despite the gaunt look that sometimes crossed his features, he was probably on the low side of thirty. So he's still quick as well as strong, thought Westervelt. If he does go for the door the way Joe predicts, Willie, my boy, you'd be sure to get out of the way. In theory, he was supposed to be helping Leidman research some problems Smith had thought up. So far, he had read one short article which had bored the ex-spacer and twice gone to the files for case folders. He was very well aware that the real idea was to have someone with Leidman constantly. For this reason, he was prepared further to assume the courtesy of answering any interrupting phone calls. He was determined that any news not censored by Pauline would be a wrong number, no matter if it were the head of the DIR himself. Leidman looked up from his reading. I'm getting hungry, aren't you, Willie? I guess so. I didn't notice, said Westervelt. How about phoning down for something? Get whatever you like. That was typical of Leidman, Westervelt realized. The man did not care what he ate. Smith would have been specific, though unimaginative. Parrish would have sent instructions about the seasoning. The girls would choose something sickening by Westervelt's standards. He shoved back his chair and stood up. I'd better see what they're doing up front, he said. I think Mr. Smith was talking about being quicker to raid our own food locker. I'll be back in a minute. Leidman raised his gray-blue eyes and stared through him curiously. No hurry, he said mildly. Westervelt thought that the man was still watching him as he walked through the door, but he did not like to look back. It might have been so. When he reached the main office, he found both girls replacing folders in the bay of current files opposite Simonetta's desk. How about letting me at the buried treasure, he asked. The thought of food is infiltrating insidiously. Willie, said Simonetta, you'll go far here. None of the other brains had such a good idea. I'll phone for something if you'll see what people want. I think Mr. Smith wants to use stuff we have in the locker, said Westervelt, blocking the way to her desk. Hold it a second while I check. He rapped on Smith's door as he opened it. He found the chief with most of the papers on his desk shoved to one side so that a built-in tape viewer could be brought up from its concealed position. Smith was scowling as if obtaining little useful information from whatever he was watching. They're getting hungry, Westervelt whispered. Is it all right to raid our guest locker? Smith shut off his machine and scrubbed one hand across his long face. Right, Willie, he agreed. The sooner the better. Take out whatever you think best and pass it around. Meanwhile, I'd better check on the situation downstairs. Come to think of it, when you called, did you get an outside line and punch the numbers yourself? No, but I have an understanding with Pauline, said Westervelt. He was thinking that Smith had put him in charge of the food, which was perhaps a little better than being sent around to take personal orders, as the girls had assumed he would do but which was still a long way beneath the conference status he had appeared to have an hour earlier. Good boy, Smith approved. Then she'll know who I want to talk to and that she shouldn't listen in. Westervelt was far from sanguine about the last condition, but left without trying to cause his chief any unhappiness. Well, so it goes, he reflected. One minute a project man, the next an office boy. If I pick out what everybody likes, I'll be a project man again. But if they like it too much, I'll turn out to be the official chef around here whenever someone important stays to lunch. The picture of sitting in on a talk with some potent official of the DIR and expounding on his brilliant solution to a problem, only to be requested to slap together a short-order meal, made him pause outside the door, frowning. Now what, Willie? asked Simonetta. He roused himself. Leave it to me, Si, he answered, working up a grin. I have everything under control. I hope you know what you're doing, Beryl commented. I won't stand for a plate of mashed potatoes and gravy or anything that fattening. You'll have your choice, Westervelt promised. I wouldn't want anything to spoil that figure. Just let me at the locker. He slipped an arm around her waist to move her aside. The flesh of her flank was softly firm under his fingers, and he made himself think better of an impulse to squeeze. Beryl stepped away, neither quickly enough to be skittish nor slowly enough to imply permissiveness. Westervelt shrugged. He stepped forward to the blank wall at the end of the file cabinets and slid back a panel to reveal a white enameled food locker. It was divided into an upper and lower section with transparent doors that rolled around into the side walls. The lower half was refrigerated. Westervelt opened the upper to explore more comfortably. Most of the foiled packages contained sandwiches, many of them self-heating. 
somewhat bulkier containers held more substantial delicacies. Welsh rabbit, turkey and baked potato, filet mignon, rattlesnake croquettes, and salmon salad. There were sealed cups of coffee, tea, or bouillon that heated themselves upon being opened, and ice cream and fruits in the freezer section. Sigh, let me have a couple of out baskets, said Westervelt, holding out his hand. Empty? All right, you're in, and barrels out trays. Do you expect me to go around with everybody's supper stuffed in my pockets? Frankly, yes, said Beryl, but not with mine. Let me see what they have in there. She examined the array while Westervelt experimented with balancing two empty desk trays across his forearm. By the time he was ready, the girls had blocked him off, and he had to wait until the possibilities had been debated thoroughly. In the end, Simonetta selected veal scallopini, and Beryl took a crab meat sandwich for herself and a filet mignon for Parrish. Westervelt grinned when he saw that she also chose four sealed martinis. Putting aside a budding curiosity about rattlesnake meat, he took a package of fried ham and eggs to see if it could be possible, and a self-heating package of mince pie. For Smith, Leidman, and Rosencrantz, he piled a tray with half a dozen roast beef and turkey sandwiches, a selection of pie and ice cream, and all the coffee containers he could fit in. Sai, pick out something nice for Pauline, he requested, noting that Beryl was already on the way across the office to perish his door. Simonetta exclaimed at her forgetfulness, pushed aside the container that she had been warming on her desk according to the instructions, and told him to go ahead. I'll take her a salad and some bouillon, she said. The kid thinks she has to watch her weight already. As an afterthought, Westervelt topped his load with a martini for Smith, on the theory that the chief was going to need it. He went in there first, let Smith see that nothing but coffee was on the way to Leidman, and made his exit directly into the hall. He made the communications room his next stop, and took what was left into the library to share with Leidman. The latter took a roast beef sandwich, pulled the heating tab, and tore it open after the required 30 seconds with one twist of his powerful fingers. Westervelt had a little more trouble with his package of ham and eggs, but the coffee cups were simpler. They sat there in silence, except for an occasional word and a brief scramble when Westervelt spilled coffee on a list of cases Leidman had thought of for further checking. The ex-spacer chewed methodically on three sandwiches and poured down two containers of coffee, scanning a copy of the Galatlas all the while. Westervelt found the fried ham and eggs to be a disappointment. I should have tried steak, he reflected. Eggs can't be done, not in taste right. There was one sandwich left, cold turkey, and Lyman had just begun on his third, so the youth helped himself. The hot mince pie had real flavor, and he was feeling quite comfortable by the time Lyman finished his ice cream. Shall I get some more coffee, Westervelt offered. Not for me, said the other. If you go back, though, you could pick up those folders. Westervelt took the excuse to leave for a few minutes. He stopped in to see if Joe wanted anything, promised to look for bourbon, and returned to the main office. He found Simonetta sipping a solitary cup of coffee. Did they leave you all alone? He demanded. Oh no, she said. The boss came out and had coffee with Pauline and me, but then she had a call for him, and he thought he'd rather take it in his office. Westervelt stepped over to Smith's door and listened. In theory, it should have been soundproof, so he opened it a crack. Hearing Smith's voice, he pushed his luck and put his head inside. The chief was busy enough on the phone not to be aware of the intrusion. Yes, I appreciate your difficulty, Smith said, obviously having said it many times before. Still, if there is no way to send us an elevator, I would much rather not have a party climbing the 25 flights to break open the door. If it has to be broken, we can do it. Westervelt recognized the answering voice, hoarser though it now was, as that of the silver-haired manager downstairs. He wondered why the sight of each other did not make both the manager and Smith want to comb their hair. Naturally, we will make good any damage, Smith said. Besides... You must have a good many other people on the lower floors of the tower to look after. Most of them are displaying the good sense to stay in their offices until the emergency is dealt with. Westervelt crept inside and moved around until he could see the face pouting on the screen of Smith's phone. The man now had heavy shadows under his eyes, although he had mopped off the perspiration that had bathed him when Westervelt had spoken with him. Well, perhaps we have slightly different problems, Smith told the manager. Problems, explained the latter. His effort to contain his emotions was clearly visible. Well, of course, if it is really serious, perhaps we can get the police to send up an emergency rescue squad. No, Smith interrupted violently. No rescue squad. We do not in any way need to be rescued. Not at all. The manager eyed him with dark suspicion. Is someone ill? He demanded. We cannot be responsible for any lawsuits due to your refusal to let us call competent authorities. Aren't you a competent authority? Demanded Smith. Just get the elevator working, will you? We'll wait until then. There is no way of knowing when power will be restored, said the manager. You must have a TV set around the office somewhere so you can hear the news bulletins on the situation as soon as I can. He paused to pop a lozenge into his mouth, sighed, and added, Sooner, I dare say. Smith had leaned back in his chair, a stricken look on his face. He saw Westervelt and began to wave frantically toward the hall. 
I never thought of that, exclaimed the youth. He burst into the hall from Smith's private entrance, realized he would have to pass the library to reach Joe Rosencrantz with an order for censorship, and circled back to the main entrance. He went in, saw Simon at a still at her desk, and opened the door to Pauline's cubicle. When he got inside with the little blonde, her swivel chair, and her switchboard, there was just about room enough to breathe. Pauline, he panted. Punch the comm room number and lend me your headset. This is cozy, she giggled, but did as he asked. Joe answered promptly. Joe, this is Willie. It just so happens that Charlie Colburn was changing transistors in all the personal sets you have down there, so you can't pick up a newscast right now, right? There was a pregnant pause before one answered. Right. That's the way it goes. Can you talk? I don't see any image. I'm with Pauline. It's okay. I mean, it was just a thought in case... Sure, said Rosencrantz. Should have thought of that myself. Everything else all right? Westervelt told them that it was, agreed that he hoped it would continue. Then he surrendered the headset to Pauline, who tickled his ribs as he squirmed around to leave the cubicle. Don't you dare, she giggled when he turned on her. I'll talk. Please no, Pauline, he sighed. Anything but that. He walked loosely past Simonetta, who stared at him unbelievingly and started to enter Smith's office again. Behind him, he heard the sounds of a door being closed and high heels clicking subduedly on the springing floor. Beryl's voice said something as he began to look around. He stopped. What did she say? he asked Simonetta. Beryl had already disappeared toward the hall. She said Mr. Parrish invited her downstairs for a cocktail. He thinks they should have about 20 minutes to relax before going back to work. You're kidding, gasped Westervelt. No, I'm not. Willie, you've been acting awfully strange. Where have you been ducking to every time? Westervelt was already running for the hall. He skidded and nearly fell going through the entrance. Beryl was standing near the elevator. Did you ring yet? asked Westervelt. No, I'm waiting for Mr. Parrish, said Beryl, in a tone that emphasized unwieldiness of an assembly of three persons. Your lipstick is smeared, said Westervelt. Beryl gave him an even less believing stare than had Simonetta, but glancing hastily at her watch, began to fumble at her compact. In here, where the light is better, said Westervelt. He grabbed her by an elbow and dragged her into the office before it occurred to her to resist. Please, Willie, you're handling me, she protested coldly. Westervelt was already out the door, bent upon taking the other entrance to Smith's office, when he saw the hall door of Parrish's office open. He reversed direction in time to meet Parrish as the latter stepped into the corridor. Beryl said to tell you she'll be right back, he said, waving a thumb vaguely in the direction of the restrooms. Oh, thanks, Willie, answered Parrish. I'll wait inside. Westervelt reached Smith's office before Parrish had completely closed his own door. From the corner of his eye, he saw the blue of Beryl's dress. Mr. Smith, he called as he thrust his head inside. I think I need your help. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of D99 by H.B. Fife. This LibriVox recording is in public domain. First sensation that penetrated, agonizingly, to Taranto's consciousness was that of heat. Heat, and then the damp itch of soaking sweat. The next feeling, as he groggily sought to take up the slack in his hanging jaw, was thirst. It was a raging demand that brought him entirely awake. Before he could control himself, he had emitted a groan. Immediately, he was dropped from whatever had been supporting him in a swaying, dipping fashion. He landed with a thud on the ground. A chatter of Sissokan broke out above him. It was answered by other Sissokan voices farther away. Taranto kept his eyes closed and lay limply where he had sprawled while he tried to figure out what had gone wrong. Shortly before dawn, he and Myers had each swallowed his capsule as directed. He remembered a period of vague drowsiness after that, then nothing more until he had been awakened just now. From his still dizzy mind, he sought to drag the outline of events expected. They had hoped to be taken out to the desert, possibly to a Sissokan burial ground, according to the local custom, and left to be dried by the desiccating blaze of the sun. It had been planned that a spaceship would land in the late afternoon to pick them up. Undoubtedly, it would take the Sissokan several hours to report the deaths and to secure official permission for disposal of the bodies, even though they were less given to red tape than Terrans. Still, they should have abandoned the bodies long before Taranto had expected to awake. He risked opening one eye a slit. Sissokan legs crowding around blocked his view, but he could tell that it was dusk. The heat he felt must be that of sand and rocks that had baked all day. It must have taken the Sissokans a long time to get this far. He wondered whether they had brought him an unusual distance into the desert, perhaps to avoid contaminating their own burial grounds, or whether they had simply indulged in some long-winded debate as to the proper course to pursue in regard to deceased aliens. My God, he thought. What if they decided to dissect us? I never thought of that. I wonder if the joker that sent those pills did. Whatever had gone wrong, he was well behind schedule. He could imagine the chagrin of the D.I.R. man watching the proceedings through his little flying spy eye. Taranto hoped the spacers hired for the pickup were still standing by. At the worst, they would have water. 
Cautiously, he tried to move his tongue inside his mouth. It stuck against his teeth. He suspected that the taste would be terrible, if he could taste it all. The heat, he thought. I've been soaking up heat all day and not sweating. Now it's jetting out of every pore. Whatever the drug had done or failed to do, it must have nearly suspended most of the normal functions of the body. No wonder he was perspiring so heavily as he began to recover. Even so, he felt as if he had a fever. He began to hope that he had not been carried for very long. Unless he had been lying in the cell, or better in some examination room at ground level, for most of the elapsed time, while disputes held up disposal of his body, some instinct told him he was very likely to die. Someone rubbed a hand roughly over his face, slipping through the film of sweat. At this demonstration, renewed exclamations broke out above him. One of the Sissokans shouted some gabble, as if to another some way off. A moment later, Taranto heard a hoarse yelp that could have come only from a Terran throat. Then words began to form, and he realized that it must be Myers. That blew the pipes, he thought, and opened his eyes. A Sissokan looking down at him hissed in astonishment. Others, who had been watching another group about twenty feet away, turned to stare down at Taranto. He was hauled to his feet by the first pair that thought of it. One, a minor officer by his red uniform, sputtered a question at the Terran, forgetting in his evident excitement that he was speaking Sissokan. Taranto wiped his face with his shirt sleeve. He was beginning to feel a trifle cooler as his perspiration evaporated in the dry air, but his surroundings seemed feverishly unreal. He could not quite understand what Myers was shouting now, but even in the hoarse voice could be detected a note of pleading. Taranto thought it must be something about water. The Sissokan before him gathered his wits and repeated his question in Terran. What does this mean? he demanded, glaring angrily at Toronto with his huge black eyes. The Terran tried to answer but could not get the words out. He gestured weakly at a water skin secured to the harness of one of the soldiers. After a brief moment of hesitation, the officer waved permission. The soldier detached the container and handed it suspiciously to Taranto. Fearing the effect of too much liquid in one jolt, the latter forced himself to take only a few small swallows. He wished he could afford to stick his whole head inside the skin and soak up the water like a blotter. You are dead, declared the officer impatiently. The tiny greenish-gray scales of his facial skin actually seemed ruffled. Taranto dizzily sought for some likely apology to excuse his being alive. He decided that there might be a slim chance of getting away with a whopper. If it is officially declared, then of course I am dead, he croaked. What do you expect? Look how weak I am. The Sissokans swiveled their narrow-pointed skulls about at each other. I'm in the last minutes, said Taranto sadly. What last minutes? asked the officer. It's the way Terrans pass on, asserted the spacer. Didn't you ever see a Terran die? The officer silently avoided admitting so much, running a hand reflectively over his thick waist, but his hesitation provided an opening. That's the way it goes, said Taranto. First a blackout, we sleep that is, then the last minutes, the sweat of death, and bluey. He raised the water skin and sneaked a long swallow, risking it because he feared he might not be allowed another. He was right. The officer snatched away the skin and thrust it into the long fingers of its indignant owner. If you are so dead, he demanded, not illogically, why do you drink up our water? Sorry, apologized Taranto. Where are we? What difference is it to you? I uh, don't want to make hard feelings or bad luck by dying in one of your burial grounds. It will not happen, said the officer grimly. We have been sent in another place to guard against that. Look back. You can see the city over that way. Taranto turned. The outline of the city walls, with lights showing here and there on the watchtowers, loomed up about five miles away. A small rise in the rolling ground of the desert hid the base of the walls and the greater part of the rough trail that it evidently followed. It would have been a fine spot for a spaceship to drop briefly to the surface. Do you wish to lie down here? asked the officer politely. We will wait until it is over. Don't be so damn helpful, thought Taranto. He looked desperately about, striving to give the impression of seeking a comfortable spot. He felt the situation turning more and more sour by the minute. It would be very difficult to feign death successfully again now that the Sissokan suspicions were so aroused. They might well make sure of him in their own way. Near him stood a half a dozen brown-clad soldiers. Four of them, spears slung on their shoulders by braided straps, had apparently been carrying him while two others acted as relief bearers. Besides the officer, there was a sub-officer, also in brown, but wearing a red harness. In the background, a similar group clustered about Myers. Taranto saw that he had been tumbled from a sort of flat stretcher of wickerwork. It was of careless craftsmanship, as if meant to be abandoned with the body it served on the last journey. He wondered if it could be assumed to be his property. 
Don't put yourselves out, he said. I can't hardly take a step even to sit down. It'll be just a couple of minutes now. Goodbye. The Sissokan officer made no move to depart. Taranto had not really dared to hope that he would. He was trying to think of some further excuse when Meyer saved him the troubles. Help! Taranto! shrieked the other spacer, bursting suddenly from the group about him. I told them we're alive and they want to kill us! He ran staggeringly toward Taranto, picking up spurts of sand. His shirt front was dark with sweat and dribbled water. He looked wild with fright. Ah, they do live, exclaimed the officer. Seize them! He seemed to realize only after about ten seconds that he had, this time, spoken Terran. Evidently feeling that not all his men might have learned that particular language, he began to repeat the order in Sissokan. Taranto interfered by swinging his fist at the center of the greenish-gray features. The Sissokan, arms flung wide, sailed backward and landed on the nape of his neck in a patch of gravel. Myers screamed hoarsely as his own bearers caught up to him and dragged him down. Taranto sprang forward to snatch up the wicker stretcher from the ground. A long-fingered hand clutched at his shoulder, but let go when he kicked backward without looking around. He raised the stretcher and swung it around in a wide arc at the three Sissokans reaching for him. Two, having left their heads unprotected, went down, but the stretcher frame crumpled. Taranto tripped the other Sissokan, glancing hopefully at the sky. There was no sign of the fire trail of a descending spaceship in the deepening twilight. Then he had to duck, as the other three bearers were upon him. Get up, Myers, he yelled. He met the rush with a hard left that dumped the leading Sissokan on his back. The next hesitated and was brushed aside by the sixth, who had had the wits to unsling his spear. Taranto sidestepped the crude but large point that thrust straight at his belly. The shaft of the spear slid along his left ribs, and he punched over the outstretched arms of the soldier at the Sissokan's head. He clamped the spear between his elbow and body, retaining it as his attacker staggered back. Two or three were now advancing from where a knot of figures seemed to be sitting upon Myers in the gloom. They did not especially hurry. Taranto had begun to reverse the spear to jab at the Sissokan left facing him when he heard a scrabbling behind him. He whirled away to his right, ducking instinctively as a body hurtled past him. When he faced about, he found that most of those whom he had knocked down were again on their feet and advancing. The officer, the lower part of his face smeared with purplish blood, ran at Taranto full tilt. He screamed an order in his own language. The spacer cracked the butt of the spear smartly against the Sissokan's head, sending him down on his face. One of the others, however, managed to get a grip on the weapon. Instinct told Taranto that any attempt at a tug-of-war on his part would lead to a fatal entanglement. He dodged away and sprinted toward the group pinning Myers. A Sissokan voice yelled mushily behind him as he concentrated upon driving with the greatest possible force into the writhing group before him. He struck with a crunch that tumbled bodies in all directions. Taranto himself felt sand scrape raspingly against the side of his face as he half-rolled, half-skidded along the ground. His pursuers now caught up to the new location of hostilities. The first thing Taranto saw as he managed to drag one knee under him was the butt end of a spear plunging at his midsection. The Sissokan behind it had his center of gravity well ahead of his turning feet, obviously intent upon doing great bodily harm. The spacer wondered for a split second why the native did not use his point. Then he twisted hips and torso to his right, drawing back his left shoulder. As the spear passed him, he slipped down hard on the shaft with his left hand. The butt dug into the sand and the Sissokan hissed in consternation as he vaulted head over heels before he could release the weapon. The one immediately behind was caught in the center of his harness by a flying foot, whereupon he collapsed with a groan across the prone figure of his comrade. Two more who had dropped their spears reached out toward Taranto, urged on by the officer on their heels. Taranto saw Meyer stagger to his feet, then the two Sissokans were all over him. He skipped away to his left over a pair of limp legs, parried a groping hand, and brought around the long, low left hook that had made him respected in past years. In the ring, he had floored men with that punch. At the least, he expected a fine, loud whoosh from the Sissokan, but the latter disappointed him. He folded in limp silence. For a second or two, everything stopped. Taranto stared down at the soldier slumped on the ground like a loose sack of potatoes. Even the Sissokans who were not at the moment engaged in pulling themselves to their feet also gaped. Light dawned for the spacer. Those among whom he had gone headhunting kept getting to their feet as fast as he knocked them down. Hit him in the gut, he yelled to Myers. That's where their brains are. He charged at the nearest Sissokan lips, drawn back in an unconscious snarl. The soldier made a reflexive motion to cross his arms before his thick abdomen. Taranto, unopposed, hit him alongside the head with a light right, then whipped the left hook in again as the arms began to lift. The Sissokan went out like a light. Come on, Taranto shouted at Myers when he saw that the other had not moved. Two of us could do it. Those heads are too little to hold a brain. K 
kick him if you can't do anything else. Are you crazy? retorted Myers, his voice hoarse as much with fear as with thirst. They'll kill us. Give up and they'll only take us back. Taranto sensed someone behind him. He started to run, but two or three recovered Sissokans headed him off. He tried to cut back to his right. He slipped in a patch of sand and saved himself from going flat only by catching his weight on both outstretched hands. One of the Sissokans landed across his back, feeling blindly for a hold. Taranto surged up, trying to butt with the back of his head. He was promptly wrapped in the long arms of another soldier facing him, as the grip from the rear slid down to his waist. The fellow behind him seemed to think he could hurt him by kneading both knobby fists into the spacer's belly, but there was too much hard muscle there. The Terran again butted forward this time and brought up his knee. This was less effective than it should have been, but it helped him free one arm so that he could drive an elbow backward. The officer ran up with a reverse spear. From the look in his big black eyes, Taranto realized that the Sissokan had also learned something during the melee. That explained, no doubt, why he was an officer. He swung the spear in a neat arc at Taranto's head. It cracked against the Terran's skull. Even though he did his best to ride with it, he felt his knees buckle. He struck out with his right fist, but the punch was smothered by the soldier whom he had kneed. The spear came down again. The world of Taranto's existence was reduced to a narrow view of a straining greenish-gray calf showing through a torn leg of a Sissokan uniform. Vaguely, he realized that he was on his hands and knees. A great number of hands seemed to be grabbing at him, and his own were very heavy as he groped out for the leg. He got some sort of fumbling grip and started to haul himself up. The slowness of his motions alarmed him in a foggy way. He tried to tuck his chin behind his left shoulder because he knew that there was something, something coming. It came. The Sissokan officer's big foot took him behind the ear with a brutal thump. Taranto, however, sinking into a gray nothingness, did not really feel it. End of chapter 10「Chapter 11 of D99 by H.B. Fife. This LibriVox recording is in public domain. Smith stood at the corner of the corridor, leaning back every half minute or so to peek around at the stretch leading toward the library and communications room. Westervelt had propped himself with folded arms against the opposite wall, facing the door to the stairs. Beryl hovered around Parrish, who faced Smith impatiently between darting glares at Westervelt. "'All right, I guess I have to tell you, Pete,' said Smith in a low tone. You might say we are temporarily inconvenienced. By him? asked Parrish, jerking a thumb in Westervelt's direction. That I can understand. The kid's beginning to think he's a comedian. He started out just now playing Charlie's aunt. Shh, said Smith softly. Westervelt turned his head toward the main entrance, wondering how far Parrish's voice had carried. Smith's dapper assistant looked from one to the other. Seeking some evidence of sanity, he turned with raised eyebrows to Beryl. The blonde rounded her blue eyes at him and shrugged. Pete, this is no joke, insisted Smith. I wish it hadn't gotten around so fast, but there it is. There what is, demanded Parrish, in a tone bordering on the querulous. Well, there's been some kind of power failure throughout the business district. There aren't any elevators running, and we don't know how long it will be until the power company copes with the trouble. No elevators, repeated Parrish. He stared at the sliding doors of the elevator shaft as if unable to comprehend the lack of such service. No elevators? And 99 stories up? Shh, said Smith, glancing down the corridor. What's the matter with you, Castor? asked Parrish. Are you watching for someone? Someone? Oh. See what I'm thinking? asked Smith. They faced each other for a moment in silence. Well, it ought to be all right, as long as he can get down the stairs if he wants to, said Parrish. I'm sorry, Beryl. We'll have to make it some other time. But how are we going to get home? asked the blonde. Oh, they'll probably have it fixed by the time we're finished here, said Parrish. Then what's all the trouble about? Why is Willie looking so sour? Westervelt braced himself against the impact of three glances and tried not to sneer. The other two men cleared their throats and looked back at Beryl. I'm going to have to ask your cooperation, Beryl, said Smith. First, Pete, I'd like to point out to you a little gem of modern design. This door here is powered to slide open automatically for a fire or other emergency. Of course, said Parrish curiously. But there isn't any power, Smith pointed out. Parrish reached out impatiently and tried the door. He wrenched at it two or three times, then bent to peer for the latch. No use, Pete, said Smith, glancing down the hall again. Willie already went through that whole routine. I've been on the phone to the building manager, and there isn't anything he can do except send a party up from the 75th floor to burn open the door from the stair side. Is he doing it? 
Well, frankly, I told him it wasn't necessary, said Smith, getting a stubborn look on his long face. But you know, Bob, expostulated Parrish, if he gets the idea that he's pinned in here... I know, I know, said Smith. On the other hand, we can always get something from the lab and break out from this side, provided we take care not to let him know what is going on until later. Westervelt eyed Beryl sardonically. He had seldom seen an expression so blended of impatience and vague worry. He wondered if anyone would explain to her. Parrish shook his head. I think it might be better to call downstairs again and have them come up, he said. I don't want to do that, said Smith. Why not? It would get around. Pretty soon the story would be all over the DIR. Parrish actually leaned forward slightly to study his chief's face. He found no words, but his very expression was plaintive. Smith sighed. We're in the business of springing spacers from jails all over the explored galaxy, he said. We're supposed to be loaded to the jets with high-potency brainwaves and have a gadget for every purpose. How is it going to look if we're locked in our own office and can't get out without help? Parrish threw up his hands. Pivoting, he walked loosely a few feet along the corridor and back, squeezing his chin in the palm of one hand. He clasped his hands behind his back then and peered around Smith at the empty wing of the corridor. Maybe we could dope him, he suggested without much feeling. I should have thought of that, admitted Smith, but he's finished eating. Can't we find something in the lab to shoot a dart? As Smith tried to remember, Westervelt interrupted. If you decide on that, I'm not volunteering, thank you. Did you ever see Mr. Lydman move in a hurry? Whoever tries it had better not miss with the first dart. Smith said, harumph, and Parrish looked uncomfortable. The assistant glanced momentarily at Beryl, but shook his head immediately. Westervelt followed his thinking. For one thing... Lydman was known to be devoted to his wife and two children. For another, who knew how badly Beryl might miss? Now if everyone will just keep calm, said Smith, and we can keep Bob busy, we'll probably get along fine until they restore power. They can't waste any time with a large part of a modern city like this cut off. It's unthinkable. I suppose you're right, said Parrish. Smith turned to Beryl. What I meant by asking your cooperation, he said, is that we'll need to have someone with Mr. Lydman most of the time. Willie has been doing it until now, but we don't want it to look like deliberate surveillance. But why? asked Beryl. I mean, I see that it worries all of you that, that he might find out. But what if he does? Possibly nothing, answered Smith. On the other hand, Mr. Lydman was once imprisoned in his space traveling days. He was held for a very long time under very trying conditions. And the experience has left him with a problem. It is not exactly claustrophobia. He paused as if to let Beryl recall other remarks about Lydman. Their general air of gravity seemed to impress her. I'll be glad to help, she said reluctantly. Fine, said Smith. Probably nothing will be necessary. Now I think we'd better go in and tell Cy so that everyone will be alerted to the situation. Westervelt caught the glance that passed between Parrish and Beryl. He was almost certain that each of them was mentally counting the people who had known before they had been told. That's what you get for being so busy in the dead files, he thought. They trooped in behind Smith. Simon had a watch as if they had been a parade. Smith, with an occasional comment from Parrish, told her the story. So that is the partial reason for staying late, he concluded. Although, of course, the case of Harris comes first. Westervelt had wandered over to a window. He adjusted the filter dial for maximum clarity and looked out. From where he was, he could see a great black carpet across part of the city, spreading out from somewhere beneath his position until it was cut by a sharp line of streetlights many blocks away. Beyond that, the city looked normal. To the near side of the invisible boundary and, he supposed, for a light distance in the opposite direction behind his viewpoint, there were only sparse and faint glows of emergency lights. Some were doubtless powered by buildings with the equipment for the purpose. Others were the lights of police and emergency vehicles on the ground or cruising low between the teller buildings. I wonder what they actually do when something like this happens, he thought. What if they think they have it fixed, turn on the juice again and it blows a second time? His reverie was interrupted by the sound of Simon at his phone. From where he was... He could see Joe Rosencrantz's features as the operator asked for Smith. Oh, there you are, Mr. Smith, said Joe. Pauline has been trying all over. Trident is transmitting, and I thought you would want to be here. They say they have a relay set up right to Harris. Smith let out a whoop and made for the door. He'll be right there, Simon had told the grinning TV man. Parrish and Westervelt trailed along. When the latter looked back, he saw that Simonetta had replaced Beryl, and he could hardly blame the blonde for seizing the chance to sit down and collect her thoughts. He felt like crawling into a hole somewhere himself. Passing the library, Parrish cocked an eyebrow at him. Westervelt nodded. He went in and told Lydman about the call. The ex-spacer was interested enough to join the procession. When Westervelt followed him into the communications room, Joe Rosencrantz was explaining the setup to Smith. Like before, we go through Pluto, Capella 7, 
and an automatic relay on an outer planet of the Trident system. But you won't see anything of that. It's after we get Johnson that the fun begins. He leaned back in his swivel chair before the screen and surveyed the group. Johnson is going to think to a fish near his island. This fish thinks to one swimming near Harris. They claim Harris answers. Smith ran both hands through his hair. We try anything, he said. Let's go. Joe got in contact with Johnson, the Terran DIR man, among other things, on Trident. The latter was not quite successful in hiding an I told you so attitude. Harris himself confirms that he is being held on the ocean floor, he said. He seems to be a sort of a pet, or curiosity. Can you make any sense out of the messages, asked Smith. I mean, is there any difficulty because of a language barrier? We don't want to make some silly assumption and find out it was based on a misunderstanding. After the weird pause caused by the mind-numbing distance, Johnson replied, There isn't any language barrier in a thought, but you might say there's sometimes an attitude barrier. Usually we can pick up an equivalent meaning if we assume, for instance, that our time sense is similar to that of one of these fish. Well, try asking Harris how deep he is, suggested Smith. They watched Johnson look away, although the man did not seem to be going through any marked effort of concentration. Hardly 30 seconds of this had elapsed when they saw him scowl. This fish off my beach can't get it through his massive intellect that he can't think directly to another fish at your position. He thinks you must be pretty queer not to have someone to do your thinking for you. Smith turned a little red. Westervelt admired Joe Rosencrantz's poker face. Johnson appeared to be insisting. Harris says he is two minutes swim under the surface, he reported. Well, how far from your position then? asked Smith. The distance turned out to be a day and a half swim. Does he need anything? Are they keeping him under livable conditions? The pause, and Johnson relayed. They pump him air and feed him. He needs someone to get him out. How can we find him? asked Smith. Can he work up any way of signaling us? You are signaling him now, he says. He wants you to get him out. Smith looked around him for questions. Lydman suggested asking how Harris was confined. Smith put it to Johnson and after the maddening pause, got an answer. He says he's in a big glass box like a freight trailer. It's like a cage. Inside, he is free to move around and he wants to get out. Then have him tell us where it is, snapped Smith. He doesn't know, came the reply. They move about every so often. What did I say, whispered Parrish, nomadic. No one took the time to congratulate him because Smith was asking what the Tridentians were like. Johnson's mental connection seemed to develop static. They saw him shake his head as if to clear it. He turned a puzzled expression to the screen. I didn't get that very plainly, he admitted. A sort of combination of thoughts. They feed him and they don't taste good. Well, tell your fishy friend to keep his own opinions out of it, said Smith, surprising Westervelt, who had not quite caught up to the situation. Johnson, a moment later, grimaced. His expression became apologetic. Don't say things like that, he told Smith, turning again to the screen. It slipped through my mind as I heard you and he didn't like it. Who, Harris? No, the fish at his end. I apologized for you. There was a general restless shifting of feet in the Terran office. Smith seemed, in the dim lighting of the communications room, to flush a deeper shade. And what does Harris say? Johnson inquired. Harris requested that they get him out. God damn it, muttered Smith. He must be punchy. It happens, Lydman reminded him softly. Yes, said Smith after a startled look. But some were like that to begin with, and his record suggested all the way. He asked Johnson to get a description of the place where Harris found himself. The answer was, in a fashion, conclusive. Like any other part of the sea bottom, reported Johnson. And furthermore, he's tired of thinking and wants to rest. Who does, demanded Smith. They won't tell me, said Johnson sadly. Smith choked off a curse, noticing Simon Anna standing there. He combed his hair furiously with both hands. No one suggested any other questions, so he thanked Johnson and told Joe to break off. At least we know it's all real, he said. He was actually taken, and he's still alive. You put a lot of faith in a couple of fish, said Lydman. Smith hesitated. Well, now, they aren't really fish, he said. Let's not build up a mental misconception just because we've been kidding about Swishy the thinking fishy. Actually, they probably wouldn't even suggest fish to an ichthyologist, and they may be a pretty high form of life. They may be as high as this Harris, commented Parrish, and earned a cold stare from Lydman. I think I'll look around the lab, said the latter, as the others made motions toward breaking up the gathering. Westervelt promptly headed for the door. He saw that Lydman was walking around the corner of the wire mesh partition that enclosed the special apparatus of the communications room, doubtless bent upon taking a shortcut into the lab. I want to go sit down a while before they pin me on him again, thought the youth. I need 15 minutes, then I'll relieve whoever has him if Smitty wants me to. End of chapter 11
Chapter 12 of D99 by H.B. Fife. This LibriVox recording is in public domain. The light, impeted after penetrating fifty fathoms of Tridentian Sea, was murky and green-tinted. But Tom Harris had become more or less used to that. It rankled, nevertheless, that the sea people continued to ignore his demands for a lamp. He knew that they used such devices. Through the clear walls of his tank he had seen night parties swimming out to hunt small varieties of fish. The watercraft they piloted on longer trips and up to the surface were also equipped with lights powered by some sort of battery. It infuriated Harris to be forced arbitrarily to exist isolated in the dimness of the ocean bottom day or the complete blackness of night. He rose from the spot where he had been squatting on his heels. So smooth was the glassy footing that he slipped and almost fell headlong. He regained his balance and looked about. The tank was about ten by ten feet and twice as long, with metal angles which he assumed to be aluminum securing all edges. These formed the outer corners, so that he could see the gaskets inside them that made the tank water tight. The sea people, he had to admit, were quite capable of coping with their environment and understanding his. The end of the tank distant from Harris was opaque. He thought that there were connections to a towing vehicle as well as to the plant that pumped air for him. The big fish had not made that quite clear to him. All other sides of the tank were quite clear. Whenever he walked about, he could look through the floor and find groups of shells and other remnants of deceased marine life in the white sand. Occasionally, he considered the pressure that would implode upon him should anything happen to rupture the walls, but he had become habitually successful in forcing that idea to the back of his mind. Along each of the side walls were four little airlocks. The use of these was at the moment being demonstrated by one of the sea people to what Harris was beginning to think of as a child. The parent was slightly smaller than Harris, who stood five feet five and weighed 130 pounds Terran. It also had four limbs, but that was about the last point they had in common. The Tridentian's limbs all joined his armored body near the head. Two of them ended in powerful pincers. The others forked into several delicate tentacles. The body was somewhat flexible, despite the weight of rugged shell segments, and tapered to a spread tail upon which the crustacean balanced himself easily. Harris felt at a distinct disadvantage in the vision department. Each of the Tridentians had four eyes protruding from his chitinous head. The adult had grown one pair of eye stalks to a length of nearly a foot. The second pair like both of the youngsters, extended only a few inches. The Terran could not be sure whether the undersea currency consisted of metal or shell, but the Tridentian deposited some sort of coin in a slot machine outside one of the little airlocks. It caused a grinding noise. Directly afterward, a small lump of compressed fish, boned, was ejected from an opening on the inside. Goddamn blue lobsters, swore Harris. Think they're doing me a favor. He let them wait a good five minutes before he decided the prudent course was to accept the offering. Sneering, he walked over and picked up the food. On days he had been too angry or too disgusted to accept the favors of sightseers. His keepers assumed that he was not hungry. In the beginning, he had also had a most difficult time getting through to them his need for fresh water. That was when he had come to believe in the large, fish-like swimmer who had transmitted his thoughts to the sea people. The fact that the latter could and did produce fresh water for him aroused his grudging respect, even though the taste was nothing to take lightly. He juggled a lump of fish in one hand causing the little Tridentian to twirl his eye stalks in glee and swim up off the ocean bottom to look down through the top of the tank. The parent also wiggled his eye stalks more sedately. Harris suspected them of laughing and turned his back. Looking through the other side of his tank, he could see, to such distance as the murky light permitted, the parked vehicles of the Tridentians. Like a collection of small boats, they were of sundry sizes and shapes, depending perhaps upon each owner's fancy, perhaps on his skill. Harris did not know whether the Tridentian's craftsmanship extended to the level of having professional builders. At any rate, they were spread out like a small city. Among them were tent-like arrangements of nets to keep out swimming vermin. Other than that, the sea people used no shelters. They were smart enough to build a cage for me, he thought bitterly. What the hell is the matter with the Terran government anyway? That Department of Interstellar Relations, or whatever they call it, why can't they get me out of here? Where did the big fish go now? He saw several of the crustacean people approaching from the camping area. Shortly, no doubt, he would again be a center of mass attention, with cubes of compressed and stinking fish shooting at him from all the little airlocks. He snarled wordlessly. The group seemed to come at certain periods, which he had been unable to define. He could only guess that they had choice times for hunting, besides other work that had to be done to maintain the campsite and their jet-propelled craft. I'd like to get one of them in here and boil him, thought Harris. Big fish claims they don't taste good. I wonder... Anyway, it would shake them up. He had long since given up thinking about what the sea people could do to him if they chose. Their flushing the tank 18 inches deep with seawater twice a day had soon given him an idea, especially as he had nowhere to go during the process. 
He no longer permitted himself to fall asleep anywhere near the inlet pipe. He noticed that the dozen or so sightseers were edging around the end of the tank to join the first individual and his offspring. Looking up, Harris saw the reason. A long dark shadow was curving down in an insolently deliberate dive. It was streamlined as a Terran shark and as long as the tank in which Harris lived. The flat line of its leading edge split into something very like a yawn, displaying astonishing upper and lower carpets of conical teeth. This was possible because the eyes, about eight, Harris thought, were spaced in a ring about the head end of the long body. They know I don't like to eat them, but I like to scare them a little. Big fish thought to Harris. Look at them trying to smile at me. Harris watched the Tridentians wiggling and waving their eye stalks as the monster passed lazily over them and turned to come slowly back. I'd like to scare them a lot, said Harris, who had learned some time ago that he got through better just by forgetting telepathy and verbalizing. Is the D.I.R. man still there? Which, what you thought? inquired Big Fish. The other Terran, the one on the island. The other air-breathing one is gone. The other Big Fish is feeding, as I have done just now. And it is not clear about the far Terran, who lacks a big fish. All the bastards on both worlds are out to lunch, growled Harris, and here I sit. You are in to lunch, agreed the monster. The three eyes that bore upon the imprisoned man as the thinker swept past the tank had an intelligent alertness. Harris had come to imagine that he could detect expressions on Big Fish's limited features. You're the only friend I've got, he exclaimed, slipping suddenly into self-pity. I wish I could go with you. Once you could, when you had your own tank. It was what we call a submarine, said Harris. I was looking to see what was on the ocean floor. Tell me, is it all like this? Is it all like what, with blue lobsters? Harris still retained enough sanity to realize that the Tridentians did not suggest Terran lobsters to this being who probably could not even imagine them. That was an automatic translation of thought furnished out of his own memory and name calling. No, he said. I mean, is it all sand and mud with a few chasms here and there? Where do these crabs get their metals? There are different kinds of holes and hills. It is all mostly the same. You cannot swim in it anywhere, although there are little things that dig under the soft sand. Some of them are good to eat, but you have to spit out a lot of sand. The crabs dig with machines sometimes, in big holes, but what they catch I do not know. Isn't there anything that catches them? asked Harris bitterly. No, they are big enough to catch other things, except a few. Things that are bigger than I am are not smart. The monster made a pass along the ocean bed near the Tridentians, stirring up a cloud of sand and causing Harris's captor to shrink against the side of his tank. He clapped the backs of his fists against his forehead above the eyes and wiggled his forefingers at the Tridentians on the other side of the clear barrier. Even after the sand had settled, he ran back and forth along the side of his tank, making sure that every sightseer had opportunity to note his gesture. He had an idea that they did not like it much. They do not like it at all, thought Big Fish. Some of them are asking for the man who lets the sea into your tank. Don't call it a man, objected Harris, giving up his posturing. I am a man. What else can I call these men except men, asked the other. I do not understand why you want to be called a man. You are different. Forget it, said Harris. It was just a figure of thought. He felt like sitting down again, but decided against it in case the onlookers should succeed in obtaining the services of the tank attendant. He walked to the end of the tank, where he could stare into the greenish distance without looking at the Tridentian camp. I wish I were dead, he muttered. They'll never get me out of here. Behind him, he heard the plop-plop of food tidbits landing on the floor of the tank as the onlooker sought to regain his attention. They must have come out of their moment of peak if they were trying to coax him to amuse them further. If I could find a bone in those hunks of fish, I'd kill myself, said Harris. The dark shape of big fish settled over the tank, cutting off what little light there was like a cloud. Harris looked up resentfully. I do not understand you, thought the monster. That would be very foolish. What, trying to commit suicide with a fishbone? No matter how, it would be extremely foolish, for then you would be dead. Harris could not think of anything to say. He could not even think of anything to think, obviously, since none of his chaotic, half-formed thoughts brought a response. It would be as if you had been eaten, insisted his friend. All right, all right, I won't do it then, if that'll make you happy, exclaimed Harris. It has no effect on how well I feed, Big Fish informed him. It took Harris a minute, but he figured it out. So that's your philosophy, he muttered to himself. Now I know what it takes to make you happy. Something to eat. Where? inquired the monster. I do not see anyone I want to eat. Never mind, said Harris. Tell me more about the ocean bottom. Where there are big holes or cliffs, can you see uh, stripes on the sides, layers of rock? Sometimes, where it is deep enough. Other places there are things growing to the bottom. 
Only little fish that are not even good to eat do their feeding there. Sometimes the sea people take away the growing things or dig holes. I'll bet there are plenty of things to get out of this ocean, mused Harris. Who knows how the climate may have changed in thousands of years. Maybe if there was an ice age, the seas would have shrunk. Maybe there was a volcanic age. Maybe you could drill underwater and find oil, if you knew where to look. Maybe there are deposits of diamonds under the ooze. He stopped when he sensed a vague irritation. He realized that his thoughts had been going out and scoring the cleanest of misses. It doesn't matter, he said. Just tell me what you do know about the sea. I can tell you where to find tribes of the sea people. I can tell you where to find all sorts of good-eating fish. I know where to think to other big fish, but that I cannot tell you, for you cannot feel it. The monster rose slowly through the water. He had seen something up there that interested him, Harris knew, and would return when it occurred to him. He considered the possibilities. Perhaps there was something in the idea of building up a food industry. If he had inside tips on where the fish were, how could you miss? Then the Tridentians must have some knowledge of where to find metals, since they used them. He suspected they had factories somewhere. Come to think of it, he asked himself, how do I know it isn't some savage tribe that picked me up? One of these days I may wind up with a more advanced bunch. I'll have to ask Big Fish when he comes back. He began to plan what he would do if he reached some higher civilization under the sea. Anyone with the knowledge to mine metals, or maybe to extract them from seawater, would be interested in contacting Terrans from another world. There would be a little trouble, probably, in getting them to comprehend space. But some of them could be sent up to the surface in tanks. Then there would be a need for some Terran who knew both worlds. I could wind up an ambassador, Harris told himself. I wonder. Maybe I could even work it with this bunch. If I could only get out of here. Come back in another submarine, maybe. He began to pace the length of his tank and back, stopping once to gather up the fish that had been bought for him by some of the crowd outside. He noted that the ladder was constantly changing without varying much in total number. He took to walking around the sides of the tank, staring into each set of eyes. In the end, this had such a hypnotic effect that he imagined himself swimming through dim, greenish light. The sea people outside began to appear as individuals. He grew into the feeling that he could recognize one from the other. He found himself running for the corner where he had collected his fish. The sound that had triggered their reaction originated at the opaque end of the tank. It was followed within seconds by several jets of water, white and forceful which entered near the floor of the structure. Harris snatched up his supply of food to keep it from being washed away. With one hand, he tried to roll up the legs of his pants. He never seemed to be prepared when the time came, but he was constantly too chilled to go around with the trousers rolled up all the time. The water swished about the calves of his legs. After a few minutes, it began to recede as the Tridentian machinery pumped it out. Soon, the tank was clean of everything but Harris, the fish, and the thick smell of seawater. He was good, came a thought. I see you are eating too. A large shadow passed overhead. Most of the Tridentians wiggled their eye stalks in an effort to look amiable. Harris dropped his fish to the damp floor. No, I'm not eating, he said. I'm all wet. So am I, answered Big Fish. But I'm not usually, said Harris. I know. It is unkind the way they let you dry out. Would you like me to knock on the end of the tank? You could have all the water you want. Not right now, said Harris calmly. He sat down, crossing his legs. I'll have to grow some gills first. It may not take much longer at that. He looked at the Tridentians who looked in at him. Again, he felt the sensation of being able to recognize individuals. Perhaps he should talk to them more often through big fish. Maybe some of them are really nice fellows, he muttered. No, his friend told him. They are not very good to eat. End of chapter 12